Hinduism, you argue that to sort of describe it as a way of life, uh, you know. I don't. I actually make the exact opposite I, point. I was going to complete my sentence that you argue that to describe it as a way of life is incorrect. Yes. That, that is, you didn't let me complete my sentence, that you argue that to describe it as that is a problem, that in fact Hinduism should be a missionary religion, which kind of defies everybody's conventional, sort of maybe lazy understanding of Hinduism. So can you explain what you mean when you say A, Hinduism is not a way of life, that's not the correct way to describe it, and B, it should be, it ought to be a missionary religion? So first of all, I uh, make this point in the context of a wider philosophical point I make about something called complex adaptive systems. Yes. Those of you who are um, chaos theory or complexity theory enthusiasts will know that almost all my writings are derived from this philosophical framework. Anyway, as far as Hinduism is concerned, the point I'm making is the following. That, look, when you say Hinduism is a way of life, basically you're left no wiser then you were, it's, it's a cop-out. Basically, it's difficult to describe in the conventional idea framework of what a religion is and therefore we'll describe it as something that actually basically means nothing. Now, the way I would prefer to put it is this. Because we, de we define religion exclusively in terms of some sort of a Abrahamic framework, therefore we tend to use, say, belief, faith and religion in the same breath. Now, Hinduism is not a belief of faith, true, but it is a religion. It is a religion in that it is interested in what th religions are usually interested in, which is ethics, uh, our place in the world, um, tradition, celebration, and all kinds of identity. identity, and all kinds of things which all other religions also uh, do, including Marxism. But where Hinduism deviates is while individual sects and traditions within Hinduism can be considered beliefs, faiths, etc., including atheism, which has a long tradition in, within Hinduism. Hinduism as a whole is not a belief. It is more a search. So, and this is not something that, you know, I have, it just turned out that way. It is very clear if you read hin Hindu texts, that is how it is meant and set up to be. So what happens in Hindu texts, those of you who are familiar with it, is that Hindu texts are all separated into two groups, which is Shruti and Smriti. Shruti. These are common, common first names for uh, girls, but mm. they actually have a very profound meaning in Hinduism. 99% of Hindu texts are Smriti, which means they are tradition, they are they're human created, the thoughts of, the, the, the records of great thoughts. And they can be changed. And they can be changed. They are not canonical at all. You can write a Smriti, I can write a Smriti, anybody yeah. can write a Smriti. Even the Bhagavad Gita is a Smriti and therefore not canonical. It is not incidentally the word of God, even the Bhagavad Gita, because it is deliberately set up this way. It is as reported by Sanjaya, not the direct words of Krishna. Yeah. So, therefore, no Smriti, not the Manusmriti, not the Gita, not, none of these Puranas, etc. are canonical. You can, every Hindu has a right to differ with them, every Hindu has a right to write new ones. The only texts that are canonical are the Vedic texts and strictly speaking the first three Vedas, the, the Rik, the Sama, which is essentially the Rik set to music and the Yajur. Now these three texts are canonical. And they are called Shruti. Shruti, i.e. heard, heard from the gods or inspired, whichever way you prefer it. But what is interesting about these texts is that they are deliberately open-ended. They do not tell you what specifically to believe in. And in fact, the node on which this entire, all of Hinduism, if you say the starting point of Hinduism, uh, is, is something called the Nasadiya Suktam. Now, all other religions start with a belief as being the starting point. So, in Islam, the starting point is there is one God and his name is, uh, and his uh, messenger is the prophet, uh, is the prophet mm. uh, uh, Muhammad. Now, if you don't believe this, you know, th the rest of it doesn't follow. It's a meaningless thing. Mm. Uh, similarly, if you're Christian, you have to believe that there is one God and Jesus Christ is his chosen son. If you don't believe it, the rest of it doesn't follow. Now, these are axioms. Now, Hinduism does not start with an axiom. It starts with a completely different premise, which is K 
clearly stated in the Nasadiya Suktam, which says, in the beginning, what was there? There was neither light nor darkness, there was neither up nor down, and then so it goes on to say there is neither this nor that, etc. Then it says, so what was there? So then it says, maybe the gods know what was there. Then it says, perhaps they know not. Surely the great wise rishis knew what there was. Then it says, perhaps they know not. And then it ends with this very intriguing line, which says, surely the great creator knows what there was. And then ends with saying, perhaps it, he too knows not. Mm -hmm. So all of Hinduism flows from this point. It is a series of questions. It is not a series of answers. Individual sects of Hinduism will give you specific answers, but Hinduism as a whole is not set up to give you answers. And in fact, the very last shloka of the Rig Veda basically says, there is space around the sacrificial fire for all the ancient gods, mm. which includes whatever existed then, but all future gods, including the non-god of the atheists. But let us come together, speak together, let our thoughts come together. So what it is, is a, is a deliberately set up framework mm. for pluralism. And it sets the ball in motion for continuous accumulation of ideas and thoughts, etc. So you can keep writing Smritis, you can keep evolving your ideas.